Um, and so first, I would like to welcome up our really great friends at Hedera. And joining us is Ty Smith, who is Senior Product, product Manager at Swirls Labs, which I just learned how to say, and I'm really excited about it. <laughs> and Ty will be talking about one of the hottest topics in blockchain and Web3 right now, which is tokenizing real-world assets. Take it away, Ty. Awesome. Thank you so much for the intro, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, I'm going to be talking about the super exciting ideas behind real-world asset tokenization. Uh, the intent of this talk is to be much more broad. Um, there, are, there is a section where I'll talk about how Hedera is tackling some of these problems, but I'm hoping 80% of the presentation, if you care about real-world assets and understanding where the market is, this will be helpful for you to learn about it, understand some of the complexities that they're, they're trying to solve and uh, some things you need to know if you're going to try to build some real-world asset tokens. Uh, again, yeah, I am uh, Ty Smith. I'm also known as Patches Online. Um, my handle is uh, SL underscore Patches for Telegram and for Twitter. If you want to follow me there, I'll be talking about all of the nerdy stuff that you can do with tokens. Uh, and yeah, let's, let's get into it. So uh, the agenda today, uh, first, what are tokenized RWAs? Kind of a little bit of a history and background to it. Um, from there, we'll go into RWA market trends and what's currently happening to make everyone start talking about this and the potential of this asset class. Uh, then we'll talk about uh, super fun, cool stuff like compliance challenges for real world assets, which arguably is the biggest issue and thing you have to consider when you're creating tokens of real world assets is the compliance in governmental entities around the world. And we'll go to kind of deep into the thought process of what you should be thinking about when you want to start development in this, uh, in this asset class. Then we're gonna go over Hedera's token service and some specific features that have been created by Hedera's protocol service, uh, HTS, to address some of these issues. And then just kind of go over the future of RWAs, and if we have time at the end, uh, a little bit of a Q&A session. So first, what are tokenized RWAs? I feel like um, in a lot of conversations, it's kind of like this is a new thing, but uh, it's, it's really, really basic. A tokenized RWA is a token that represents a real world asset. So the, the basic core, simplest form. And this is not new for humans. Um, in 3000 BC Mesopotamia, we used sealed clay with tokens inside that we would take to uh, a, a place, a market, and then you would sell livestock, oil, and the different size of the tokens, and the seal of the clay would have the validity that that's an asset class, because you don't want to take your 300 cattle into town to try to sell them to someone else. And so as human beings to, in commerce, we have been creating RWAs, tokenized RWAs for a long time. And that tradition has carried over in all the different means that we've conducted business, which includes the modern digital age. And so you have bank ledgers that are privatized inside of their architecture, dictating what a tokenized asset is in the digital realm. And we're in this new era of taking those tokenized RWAs in the digital era to the decentralized digital age. And so we're taking them from centralized, privatized you know, computers and servers and putting it on a ledger. And so that's it, this, the new iteration of a very, very old asset class from 3000 BC. Awesome. Uh, so some of the, the main reasons why we want to bring it into the decentralized digital age are uh, liquidity. You know, tokenization increases the liquidity access of assets and enables global trading. So if you have an asset class inside of a country uh, that is inside a certain jurisdiction, you might only have three to four potential people that would have enough money to invest in that. But if you can take it onto a decentralized ledger and give access to liquidity in a global market, you might have tens of thousands of people who can get to access to that uh, and, and provide liquidity for that, the movement and then the investment from globally. So, the decentralizedness gives it a lot more access to um, people gaining value and people who need value to exchange. Uh, a really big one is fractional ownership. So investors might not have $150,000, but they might have $1,000. And so if you can have fractionalized tokenization of your real world asset, you can lower the barrier of entry for people who are just financially boxed out of a really nice asset class because they don't have the capital to get into it. And so being able to fractionalize that ownership can democratize access to really nice um, ways of, 
uh, investment or in um, savings. However, whatever the real world asset is, it's, it's, I'm going to say it a billion times. I mean, I'll start saying RWAs, but uh, there's a lot of different ways that fractionalized ownership can, again, lower the barrier of entry and get a lot more people into uh, kind of financial freedom, the, the old ethos of crypto that I, I think should, should still be alive. Uh, you also get transparency. So blockchain technology ensures that there is transparency of this asset. If you are double minting the same asset, you can see that. If a bank double gives out a real world asset, you cannot see that. And so um, this, the ability to having trustlessness inside of a global fractionalized market of tokens is much better than a trust-based centralized version of this, uh, of this paradigm that we, we currently live. So I, all of these are reasons why we're seeing this uptick in interest in RWAs and the decentralized uh, nature of them. And that transparency, I think, is, is paramount to, to not needing to trust, uh, which again is kind of the, the whole point of blockchain technology. Uh, and then the last big thing is security. If a bank has a system of a database and it gets hacked, or if they, you know, um, when they brick the system and they require crypto to unbrick the system, something happens and damages or, or is hacked inside of a bank system, that ledger is centralized. And it might be hard to recover those, those digital assets, but you gain the security of a decentralized system when you put it on blockchain. And so the ability to destroy a real world asset or its provenance is much, much harder if you are putting it onto the blockchain. So right now, again, a lot of people are talking about RWAs. And so I'm gonna go over sort of like the big hitters of uh, a really good report from CoinGecko. Uh, if you're interested at all at RWAs, I would really uh, recommend just Google searching CoinGecko RWA 2024 report. They did a really deep dive into the just current state of the market, where the market's going, uh, and it's just a really good informational source if you care about this vertical. Uh, so the first thing, uh, or the, the real estate is the first one I put up here for um, just diving into deep and just getting an understanding and testing the waters of how, how explosive, explosive this market can be. Uh, the tokenized real estate market is projected to hit 1.4 trillion by 2030, which is extremely high. Um, there's tons of real estate all over the globe. Again, democratizing access to uh, that liquidity all over the globe for people to purchase uh, real estate is, is just paramount to a lot of uh, getting investment in your, in your asset that you want uh, instead of being restricted. Uh, commodities, so tokenized commodities are very popular, particularly gold. We already have Pax G um, as, as a token that you can buy that uh, symbolizes gold. You don't have to move gold around, which is quite heavy. Uh, if you wanna have some fun, you can like Google search how people move large amounts of gold and how much it costs. It's kind of crazy how they do it. Uh, and again, this fractionalized tokenized uh, um, decentralized mechanism just makes it much easier to, to transact. Uh, financial instruments, we're seeing bonds, equities, money market funds, all of those uh, are expected to hit 300 billion this year in 2024 and 3 trillion by 2030. So an immense amount of capital. Uh, our uh, agriculture, uh, an estimated market potential of $200 billion in 2030. Uh, having farmers who need access to liquidity to buy new machinery, maybe they give some of the yield of their crops per year and tokenize that. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can help small businesses uh, if they're able to have access to this global market. Uh, healthcare, uh, healthcare assets, including medical equipment and uh, IP, are anticipated to hit a market of 150 billion uh, by, by 2030. Uh, supply chain, which is really close to uh, Hedera's heart. You know, we have uh, Avery Dennison, which has Atma, and they track about 150 transactions per second, tracking all supply chain movement all over the globe for um, understanding the eco and carbon output. And that potential of the market of supply chain is around $250 billion. Uh, and then renewable energy. Um, another thing that Hedera is re really close to our heart uh, tokenizing renewable energy projects um, such as solar and wind farms, carbon credits, tracking carbon credits so they can't be double spent, uh, that can attract around 300 billion in 2030. So I've said a lot of giant billion trillion dollar numbers and all by 2030, so in the next six years, all to say, there's an immense amount of trajectory, trajectory and pressure for RWAs to hit a huge market cap, and with that, we need to start thinking about how do we develop the technology to meet where the compliance needs so that this can happen? How do we enable that growth that wants to happen through these, the, these trajectories? So this, this is the fun part. Now we're gonna talk about governments, laws and the real hard part of tokenizing your RWA. Because 
we've been tokenizing things for a while. Uh, de decentralized tokenization, NFTs, FTs, you know, fungible tokens, they're all quite simple. But how do you make an RWA actually function as what it's meant to do? Uh, that you actually have legal ownership of this asset, you can prove it. So classification of tokens uh, is the first fun part. If you live in America, you understand that the SEC has been back and forth. There's no real regulatory understanding of, uh, of securities. Uh, we have a little bit of clarity with Ethereum now. Uh, it now has an ETF, which arguably classifies that not as a security and possibly a commodity, but it's still not defined. Um, RWA token classification, uh, the legal and regulatory frameworks of real world assets in most countries is still being developed. If you are a technologist trying to assess this market, you must understand that the governments that control the ability for you to make an asset that functions as you want is in, mo is in motion. They, it's continually changing. And so you have to have a lot of awareness of the jurisdictions that you're trying to deploy these assets in and the governmental entities inside of those jurisdictions and what they're trying to craft, because it will continually change over the next six years as we onboard these trillion dollars of liquidity into this asset class. Um, everyone's favorite topic, taxation. Uh, there's some, uh, some challenges with taxation in RWAs that are gonna need to be figured out in the next six years. Uh, how do you tax a tokenized real-world asset when the asset is in Dubai and the holder is in Alabama? Is it based on the Alabama local state tax? Is it based in Dubai? Uh, none of this is really solidity, uh, solidified yet. Um, it's still, again, in flux. So just paying attention to these regulatory compliance issues if you want to get into this. How do you build technology that easily adapts when things change? Uh, th these are all considerations. Um, setting up legal entities to uh, adjust uh, to, uh, sorry, establish legal entities so that you can easily comply with these taxation changes. Uh, forward thinking of how people have been solving this problem in the past and how can you make it so it's much more flexible in the future. Sometimes that requires setting up an LLC or a C Corp or a B Corp uh, and able to um, execute the taxation that you, you get on the asset class in the future probable way, because again, it's not solidified, but you have to think about what is it going towards and what do I need to have in place today to make sure if it goes that way, I can be legally compliant without upsetting my token class I've already distributed in a decentralized market. Uh, and then reporting profits and losses. If I'm in Alabama and I have an asset in Dubai and it goes up 10%, do I report that to Alabama? Is it a tax thing only in Dubai that I have to pay for the profits? It's unknown, uh, and so again, it just a lot of compliance challenges are in front of us, and I think we'll see a lot of layer one networks and a lot of technologists working with governments over the globe to try to make sure that these laws, as they come out, are sensical. Uh, there's a lot of times where technology and black and white governmental laws do not make sense together, and since we have this opportunity to tokenize these assets, we should... Uh, I would love to see the development of these laws that dictate them to be forward thinking with technology in mind and not restrictive because it wasn't considered at the time of the law being written. All right, and then legalized ownership. I kind of touched on this a little bit, uh, but uh, clarifying legal rights. If I own a floor 28 of a building and that building burns down, do I have a legal right to sue the owner of the building because they told me they had fire insurance and they didn't? Is there any legal rights that I have at all? Um, all of these, like, again, you can tokenize a floor, you can know that the leaseholder owns the lease, but what are the rights of the person who owns the token and what are their legal recourse? So how, what abilities do they have to gain back value of their investment if the investment goes bunk that's beyond their, their means? Um, again, I, I have no answers but problems. Uh, <laughs> uh, right now it's just, what are the, these are the challenges ahead of us and how do we as technologists make sure that while we tokenize these assets, they are flexible and they are um, able to grow with this compliance that is going to be solidified in these next six years. I, I promise it's the last slide on compliance challenges, but it, it also is quite important for RWAs, uh, which is why I had you know, two slides. 
the regulatory uncertainty, we have a global variability of different countries having regulations for tokenized assets. Again, America has the SEC, which has been very wishy-washy on how it's applying uh, what it sees as the, what is illegal, what is not legal, uh, what, is a compliant, what is a class, what is not a, a security. And so with that variability, you have uncertainty, and with uncertainty, you have uh, roadblocks to getting this, again, this asset class and this liquidity to, to go forward. So uh, I would imagine as we see this asset class and vertical grow, they will start in the places that have the most solidified jurisdiction and laws written that will allow the asset class to not have the variability of, that's a security now and you can't do what you've done. Because, you know, you, you want to reduce your... your um, your openness to uh, legal recourse as, as, as much as possible, especially from governments. Um, and then, uh, yeah, security and fraud prevention, um, ensuring that the token offerings comply with securities laws to protect investors. If you are in a jurisdiction that has a securities law and you're selling tokenized real world assets or securities, you have to make sure that you have investor protections in place. Consider how do you have uh, investor protection, how do you have anti-fraud measures inside of the market and mechanisms you're building for your, your, your application uh, and making sure that you empower the people that are investing to, again, comply with laws and to give them some trustless understanding of what they're investing in and what, again, what legal recourses do they have. Be very upfront about that as these, as these markets are, are created. Uh, and then the last one, really uh, super fun topic, AML and KYC requirements. Um, there's compliance with AML laws that would make putting real world assets on a decentralized ledger uh, untenable if you need to make sure that you're doing some AML laws. So make sure that the method in which you tokenize does not accidentally make you susceptible to anti-money uh, laundering laws. Uh, know your customer, um, verifying the identities of the people uh, to prevent illicit activities. Again, depending on the jurisdiction you're in, that's gonna be required. And then be mindful of the different levels of KYC. Some asset classes might need sophisticated investor rules, which is over, I think, 150K in US. And so even though you've KYC'd, you haven't verified that they meet this certain class of investment that's required by law to take a fractionalized ownership of an asset class. So um, a lot to say. Make sure you just research laws about the jurisdictions you want to deploy your market in. And again, as technologists and as, as builders of new blockchain technology, we should be considering how do we simplify these issues for people to tokenize assets and onboard this liquidity. So there's tons of problems, and I told you a little bit about this would be specific to Hedera, so uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how Hedera Token Service kind of aims to solve some of these issues. Uh, first, if you do not know what Hedera is, uh, quickly, we are an L1 DAG uh, network utilizing Hashgraph consensus. Um, the next-gen consensus Hashgraph, it's faster, fairer, and has secure tra transactions with a Hashgraph. Uh, it's efficient with 10,000 TPS in three to five seconds uh, to true finality. Um, a lot of these benefits that I'm talking about come from asynchronous byzantine fault tolerant. Um, so it has no leader to attack and with that asynchronous um, ability, we also get a lot more integrity, integrity and trust with tokenized assets on the protocol. It's economical, so it does have low cost transactions, but specifically they're, they're pegged to USD. So, so fees on Hedera are pegged to USD and you can plan out how much you need to transact on the network and how much USD you need for a quarter, which is highly important for these slower assets like RWAs that need to understand what are their quarterly enterprise budgets and then what do they need to, um, what do they need to purchase each quarter to transact on the network. It doesn't change, so that's a, that's a benefit. And then um, stable governance. This is probably one of the best um, uh, one of the, the biggest benefits of Hedera for real world assets is that our governance model has 33 uh, right now global organizations like Google, Ubisoft, and they're all over the globe. And so there's 33 different corporations that already fundamentally understand the problems of tokenizing in different jurisdictions across the globe. And with that understanding, they've helped directed the trajectory of the protocol to be built to comply with all of these complexities across the globe. 
And so this is sort of where preparation meets opportunity for Hedera, where we've been preparing for this, and now as real world assets are looking to onboard onto um, blockchain, uh, we have a lot of technology that has thought about these issues for five years, and uh, again, I'll get into a little bit of that in the next slide. Uh, Eco-conscious, it's uh, energy efficient. Uh, one transaction on Hedera, it takes one one thousandth the energy of a Visa transaction. So it uses very little energy and then we buy carbon credits to make us carbon neutral or, um, or carbon negative. And then uh, cross-chain ready. It does, uh, we strive for EVM equivalency. You can deploy Solidity onto Hedera and interact with our native services. Uh, our biggest DEX uh, saucer swap is a uh, Uniswap. Uh, you know, EVM uh, compatible execution. So we do have the ability to write Solidity and execute the things that you want to execute onto our network. So uh, now I'm going to go into the token service. So Hedera has its own token service, which is a protocol on the network. Uh, it's native tokenization, so it's direct creation, management, and transfer of tokens on the network. It's not a smart contract. Uh, so this reduces risk. You have no reliance on potential vulnerable smart contracts. You can't accidentally um, compile with the wrong compiler and have some vulnerabilities. Uh, you lose a little bit of flexibility, but you gain a lot of understanding of security and of knowing exactly what can happen because it's a protocol. It's, it's not a smart contract. Um, and you still have access to atomic swaps. So if you need to tokenize a fractionalized asset, take money in, uh, fractionalize the asset, and then send that fractionalized asset back to the account, you can do that in an atomic transaction. Either it's successful or it fails somewhere along the way uh, to make sure that your, your, your work streams are still um, very efficient uh, in that manner. You don't have to get halfway through a process and then roll it back. Uh, KYC and AML uh, capabilities. So the token service, when you create a token, has a bunch of keys at the top level. If you need KYC, you can set a KYC key when you create the token, and then when you sign uh, accounts that can take that uh, token class, they, the token needs to have the account to have been signed by the KYC key. That enables you to take a token, to create it with a KYC key, and when people go to your marketplace and do know your customer, you can then sign their account. And then that token can go into a decentralized marketplace, but it can't be transacted to people that have not KYC'd. So it gives you that legal compliance that you need for whatever governmental entity you're working inside of, and you can put it into a decentralized market because the protocol is thought, of, thought ahead and made sure that you have to sign the transaction for it to go to that account, otherwise it can't go to that account. It gives you that security uh, that you're not going to accidentally put it on decentralized market and it'll go to a, uh, an account that has no KYC and becomes a legal asset. Uh, token freezing and wiping. Um, USDC is probably uh, one of the biggest RWAs in current um, circulation and they have a freezing component for compliance. Uh, you can do the same with Hedera's token service. Uh, freeze key will allow you to freeze the asset in any, any wallet. Wipe key will allow you to wipe the asset out of any wallet. And I want to stress, the protocol has built-in trustlessness. If the token is built without a KYC key or a token freeze key, it cannot be added later. And so that gives the customers understanding that when they look at the token asset class, if there is no KYC key or there is no wipe key, it cannot be added, I know that this can't be wiped from my account. So the idea is to bring the flexibility and needs of a enterprise industry to allow that tokenization to be simplistic while in, uh, empowering the people that use the tokens to look at what, the, um, what are the um, approved permissions of the key list and know that they cannot change. And so that gives them the, the trustlessness. Uh, they can see what the key list is and say, okay, I've agreed to this, I'm gonna take the token, or I think it's a, I don't like that, I'm not gonna take the token. And it won't change. Uh, and then the last thing, uh, token association. So this ensures that only intended tokens can be sent to accounts. Uh, when the Ethereum ETF was created, I think it took less than a week for someone to send Tornado Cash to that account, which then made it le legally not compliant with the SEC, right? Um, on Hedera, our accounts have something called token association. And so the account must say, I accept this token ID before that token ID can be sent to that account. This is really important if you wanna make sure that you restrict illegal assets from being sent to a main account that might be the main account of an enterprise trying to tokenize real world assets. 
All right, this is the last slide of HTS, but there's a lot of cool stuff in the, the token service, which is why we're talking about it. Um, you can have custom fees and royalties. Uh, this is not a optional function on a smart contract, but it is executed by the protocol when the NFT moves from wallet to wallet. And so if you have royalties, uh, they will be executed uh, when you do the sale by the protocol and it's not optional. So it gives that, uh, it gives that a, uh, enforcement it's going to happen, which you know our NFTs on Hedera still have royalties attached to them, uh, and this uh, this custom fee protocol layer gives it uh, just much more reliability than the optional function in a smart contract. Uh, the HTS does support fungible and non-fungible tokens, so both can be done fractionalized or NFTs. Uh, and then it has integrations with existing systems. If you develop Solidity and use EVM, there are ways for you to interact with HTS tokens, essentially uh, pretty close to if they're ERC-20s. And so you can have really good flexibility with your application and you can still write your code in Solidity while enabling your users to have the protection of a Hedera token service token. Awesome. Uh, I have uh, about five minutes, so I'm gonna go a little bit quick through these innovative use cases, uh, but there are some RWAs that are currently deployed on Hedera that are doing really cool things. Uh, first one is Red Swan. Uh, so Red Swan is uh, a real estate platform that has about $4 billion of real estate in their portfolio, and it's managed by Dubai-based uh, White Rocks Holding. And they have built a marketplace on Hedera that tokenized real world assets of real estate and uh, they transact inside their marketplace. It's very, very cool. Uh, Archax uh, is a regulated digital securities exchange custodian and brokerage using Hedera um, for its infrastructure. It also deploys on a bunch of other networks, but when they needed to tokenize the BlackRock uh, money market fund, um, Aberdeen and Archax tokenized a, a section of that fund, they chose Hedera. And uh, the CEO specifically talked about the token association as the reason why they chose Hedera as the network, because they knew that they wouldn't be able to have, again, tornado cash or some illegal asset being sent to that account. Uh, and then Dovu. Uh, Dovu is a, um, a ESG marketplace for carbon credits. And so they are tokenizing carbon credits and bringing trustlessness on not being able to double spend green credits, uh, being able to track where these carbon credits are originating. Uh, they work with the Guardian, uh, and there's a lot of environmental benefits when you make sure that carbon credits aren't being double spent, uh, and then you can have that trustlessness that when you buy one, it's real. Uh, and so Dovu is doing a lot of great work uh, with the Guardian on Hedera. All right, and then I'm just gonna close up with some, some future of RWA stats, uh, just where this trajectory is going and what, um, what we can expect over the next uh, six years. Uh, by 2030, the tokenized RWA market is projected to exceed $16 trillion in total. So it's an immense amount of liquidity, it's an immense amount of need, and a lot of ways that we can provide financial sovereignty to users across the world in this massive uh, uh, onboarding event of major institutions to tokenize their assets. Uh, decentralized investment, tokenization enables uh, fractional ownership. Uh, or, yeah, I already talked about that. Um, unprecedented liquidity, uh, tokenized assets can be traded 24 seven. It's not based on the stock market, it's not based on when banks are open, but when these assets are tokenized in a global, uh, in a global scale, when we have a $16 trillion market, they will also move faster. So it's not just about the money that is on chain, the chain will enable the assets to be sold 24 seven and we'll see an expedition of a lot of transactions and movements of these real world assets. So the world's gonna get even faster after we get to uh, a $16, $16 trillion market cap. Uh, and then environmental impact. Again, renewable projects, uh, supply tokenization will attract 300 billion investment by 2030. Uh, and it'll ex accelerate the transition to sustainable future when you know that you're purchasing a carbon credit and it's provable on chain, corporations will have more incentive to do so. And that's, that's just a need that we have in the world. So I'm very excited to see that future. Uh, that's, that's everything about RWAs. <laughs> Yeah, if anyone has any questions, I can try to answer them. I think that's good. Yeah. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Ty. Um, thank you. That was great. And lucky for everyone here, Hedera is not going anywhere. They have a booth down.